All humanity of Callisto, the fourth major satellite of Jupiter, had for many years been waging a desperate and apparently hopeless defense against invading hordes of six-limbed beings. Every city and town had long since been reduced to level fields of lava by the rays of the invaders. Every building and every trace of human civilization had long since disappeared from the surface of the satellite. Far below the surface lay the city of Zbarg, the largest of the few remaining strongholds of the human race. At one portal of the city a torpedo-shaped, stubby-winged rocket plane rested in the carriage of a catapult. Near it the captain addressed briefly the six men normally composing his crew. Men, you already know that our cruise today is not an ordinary patrol. We are to go to one, there to destroy a base of the Hexans. We have perhaps one chance in ten thousand of returning. Therefore I am taking only one man, barely enough to operate the plane. Volunteers step one pace forward. The six stepped forward as one man, and a smile came over the worn face of their leader as he watched them draw lots for the privilege of accompanying him to probable death. The two men entered the body of the torpedo, sealed the openings and waited. Three exits, snapped the captain of the portal, and twelve keen-eyed observers studied minutely screens and instrument panels connected to the powerful automatic lookout stations beneath the rims of the widely separated volcanic craters from which their craft could issue into Callisto's somber night. No hexen radiation can be detected from Exit 8, came the report. The captain of the portal raised an arm in warning, threw in the guides, and the two passengers were hurled violently backward, deep into their cushion seats, as the catapult shot their plane down the runway. As the catapult's force was spent automatic trips upon the undercarriage actuated the propelling rockets and mile after mile, with rapidly mounting velocity, the plane sped through the tube. As the exit was approached, the tunnel described a long vertical curve, so that when the opening into the shaft of the crater was reached and the undercarriage was automatically detached, the vessel was projected almost vertically upward. Such was its velocity and so powerful was the liquid propellant of its rocket motors, that the eye could not follow the flight of the warship as it tore through the thin layer of the atmosphere and hurled itself out into the depths of space. Did we get away? asked the captain, hands upon his controls and eyes upon his moving chart of space. I believe so, sir, answered the other officer, at the screens of the six periscopic devices which covered the full sphere of vision. No reports from the rim, and all screens blank. Once more a vessel had issued from the jealously secret city of Zbark without betraying its existence to the hated and feared Hexans. For a time the terrific rocket motors continued the deafening roar of their continuous explosions, then, the desired velocity having been attained, they were cut out and for hours the good ship's arc hurtled on through the void at an enormous but constant speed toward the distant world of one which it was destined never to reach. Captain Zov Hexen radiation, coordinates 22, 14, area 6, cried the observer, and the commander swung his own telescopic finder into the indicated region. His hands played over course and distance plotters for a brief minute, and he stared at his results in astonishment. I never heard of a hexen traveling that way before, he frowned. Constant negative acceleration and in a straight line. He must think that we have been cleared out of the ether. Almost parallel to us and not much faster, even at this long range, it is an easy kill unless he starts dodging, as usual. As he spoke, he snapped a switch and from a port under the starboard wing there shot out into space a small package of concentrated destruction, a rocket-propelled, radio-controlled torpedo. The rockets of the tiny missile were flaming, but that flame was visible only from the rear and no radio beam was upon it. Zuth had given it precisely the direction and acceleration necessary to make it meet the hexen sphere in central impact, provided that sphere maintained its course and acceleration unchanged. Shall I direct the torpedo in the case the hexen shifts? asked the officer. I think not. They can, of course, detect any wave at almost any distance, and at the first sign of radioactivity they would locate and destroy the bomb. They also, in all probability, would destroy us. 
I would not hesitate to attack them on that account alone, but we must remember that we are upon a more important mission than attacking one Hexen ship. We are far out of range of their electromagnetic detectors, and our torpedo will have such a velocity that they will have no time to protect themselves against it after detection. Unless they shift in the next few seconds, they are lost. This is the most perfect shot I ever had at one of them, but one shot is all I dare risk, we must not betray ourselves. Course, look out, and rank forgotten, the little crew of two stared into the narrow field of vision, set at its maximum magnification. The instruments showed that the enemy vessel was staying upon its original course. Very soon the torpedo came within range of the detectors of the Hexans. But as Captain Zub had foretold, the detection was a fraction of a second too late, rapidly as their screens responded, and the two men of Zbark uttered together a short, fierce cry of joy as a brilliant flash of light announced the annihilation of the Hexan vessel. But hold! The observer stared into his screen. Upon that same line, but now at constant velocity, there is still a very faint radiation, of a pattern I have never seen before. I think. I believe. The captain was studying the pattern, puzzled. It must be low-frequency, low-tension electricity, which is never used, so far as I know. It may be some new engine of destruction, which the Hexen was towing at such a distance that the explosion of our torpedo did not destroy it. Since there are no signs of Hexen activity and since it will not take much fuel, we shall investigate that radiation. Tail and portside rockets burst into roaring activity and soon the plane was cautiously approaching the mass of wreckage, which had been the IPV Arcturus. Human beings, although of some foreign species, exclaimed the captain, as his vision ray swept through the undamaged upper portion of the great liner and came to rest upon Captain King at his desk. Although the upper ultralights of the terrestrial vessel had been cut away by the Hexen plane of force, jury lights had been rigged, and the two commanders were soon trying to communicate with each other. Intelligible conversation was, of course, impossible, but King soon realized that the visitors were not enemies. At their pantomime suggestion he put on a spacesuit and wafted himself over to the airlock of the Calistonian warplane. Inside the central compartment, the strangers placed over his helmet a heavily wired harness, and he found himself instantly in full mental communication with the Calistonian commander. For several minutes they stood silent, exchanging thoughts with a rapidity impossible in any language, then, dressed in spacesuits, both leaped lightly across the narrow gap into the still-open outer lock of the terrestrial liner. King watched Zub narrowly after the pressure began to collapse his suit, but the stranger made no sign of distress. He had been right in his assurance that the extra pressure would scarcely inconvenience him. King tore off his helmet, issued a brief order, and soon every speaker in the Arcturus announced. All passengers and all members of the crew except lookouts on duty will assemble immediately in Saloon 3 to discuss a possible immediate rescue. The subject being one of paramount interest, it was a matter of minutes until the full complement of 200 men and women were in the main saloon, clinging to hastily rigged handlines, closely packed before the raised platform upon which were King and Zov, wired together with the peculiar Calistonian harness. To most of the passengers, familiar with the humanity of three planets, the appearance of the stranger brought no surprise, but many of them stared in undisguised amazement at his childish body, his pale, almost colorless skin, his small, weak legs and arms, and his massive head. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain King opened the meeting. I introduce to you Captain Zuv, of the Scout Cruiser Zark, of the only human race now living upon the fourth large satellite of Jupiter, which satellite we know as Callisto. I am avoiding their own names as much as possible, because they are almost unpronounceable in English or interplanetarian. This device that you see connecting us is a Calistonian thought transformer, by means of which any two intelligent beings can converse without language. Our situation is peculiar, and in order that you may understand fully what lies ahead of us, the captain will now speak to you, through me, that is, what follows will be spoken by Captain Zov, of the Zark, but he will be using my vocal organs. 
Friends from distant Tellus, King's voice went on, almost without a break, I greet you. I am glad, for your sake as well as our own, that your vessel was able to destroy the Hexen ship holding you captive, and whose crew would have killed you all as soon as they had landed your vessel and had read your minds. I regret bitterly that we can do so little for you, for only the representatives of a human civilization being exterminated by a race of highly intelligent monsters can fully realize how desirable it is for all the various races of humanity to assist and support each other. In order that you may understand the situation, it is necessary that I delve at some length into ancient history, but we have ample time. In about. He broke off, realizing that the two races had no thought in common in the measure of time. One half-time of rotation of great planet upon axis flashed from Zuv's brain, and about five hours, King's mind flashed back. It will be about five hours before any steps can be taken, so that I feel justified in using a brief period for explanation. In the evolution of the various forms of life upon Callisto, two genera developed intelligence far ahead of all others. One genus was the human, as you and I, the other the hexen. This creature, happily unknown to you of the planets nearer our common sun, is the product of an entirely different evolution. It is a six-limbed animal, with a brain equal to our own, one perhaps in some ways superior to our own. They have nothing in common with humanity, however, they have few of our traits and fewer of our mental processes. Even we who have fought them so long can scarcely comprehend the chambers of horror that are their minds. Even were I able to paint a sufficiently vivid picture with words, you of earth could not begin to understand their utter ruthlessness and inhumanity, even among themselves. You would believe that I was lying, or that my viewpoint was warped. I can say only that I hope most sincerely that none of you will ever get better acquainted with them. Ages ago, then, the human and the hexen developed upon all four of the major satellites of the great planet, which you know as Jupiter and upon the north polar region of Jupiter itself. By what means the two races came into being upon worlds so widely separated in space we know not, we only know it to be the fact. Human life, however, could not long endure upon Jupiter. The various human races, after many attempts to meet conditions of life there by variations in type fell before the Hexans, who, although very small in size upon the planet, thrived there amazingly. Upon the three outer satellites humanity triumphed, and many hundreds of cycles ago the hexans of those satellites were wiped out, save for an occasional tribe of savages of low intelligence who lived in various undesirable portions of the three worlds. For ages then there was peace upon Callisto. Here is the picture at that time, upon Jupiter the hexans, upon Io hexans and humans, waging a ceaseless and relentless war of mutual extermination, upon the three outer satellites humanity in undisturbed and unthreatened peace. Five worlds, each ignorant of life upon any other. As I have said, the hexans of Jupiter were, and are, diabolically intelligent. Driven probably by their desire to see what lay beyond their atmosphere of eternal cloud, to the penetration of which their eyesight was attuned, they developed the spaceship, and effected a safe landing, first upon the barren, airless moonlet nearest them, and then upon fruitful Io. There they made common cause with the Hexans against the humans, and in space of time Ionian humanity ceased to exist. Much traffic and interbreeding followed between the Hexans of Jupiter and those of Io, resulting in time and a race intermediate in size between the parent stocks and equally at home in the widely variant air pressures and gravities of planet and satellite. Soon their astronomical instruments revealed the cities of Europa to their gaze, and as soon as they discovered that the civilization of Europa was human, they destroyed it utterly, with the insatiable bloodlust that is their heritage. In the meantime the human civilizations of Ganymede and Callisto had also developed instruments of power. Observing the cities upon the other satellites, many scientists studied intensively the problem of space navigation, and finally there was some commerce between the two outer satellites at favorable times. Finally, vessels were also sent to Io and to Europa, but none of them returned. Knowing then what to expect, Ganymede and Callisto joined forces and prepared for war. 
But our science, so long attuned to the arts of peace, had fallen behind lamentably in the devising of more and ever more deadly instruments of destruction. Ganymede fell, and in her fall we read our own doom. Abandoning our cities, we built a new underground. Profiting from lessons learned full bloodily upon Ganymede, we resolved to prolong the existence of the human race as long as possible. The Hexans were, and are masters of the physical science. They command the spectrum in a way undreamed of. Their detectors reveal etheric disturbances at unbelievable distances, and they have at their beck and call forces of staggering magnitude. Therefore in our cities is no electricity save that which is wired, shielded, and grounded, no broadcast radio, no source whatever of etheric disturbances save light and our walls are fields of force which we believe to be impenetrable to any searching frequency capable of being generated. Now I am able to picture to you the present. We are the last representatives of the human race in the Jovian planetary system. Our every trace upon the surface has been obliterated. We are hiding in our holes in the ground, coming out at night by stealth so that our burrows shall not be revealed to the hexans. We are fighting for time in which our scientists may learn the secrets of power and fearing each new day that the enemy may have so perfected their systems of rays that they will be able to detect us and destroy us, even in our underground and heavily shielded retreats, by means of forces even more incomprehensible than those they are now employing. Therefore, friends, you see how little we are able to do for you, we erase fighting for our very existence and doomed to extinction save for a miracle. We cannot take you to Callisto, for it is besieged by the Hexans and the driving forces of your lifeboats, practically broadcast as they are, would be detected and we should all be destroyed long before we could reach safety. Captain King and I have pondered long and have been able to see only one course of action. We are drifting at constant velocity, using no power, and with all save the most vitally necessary machinery at rest. Thus only may we hope to avoid detection during the next two hours. Our present course will take us very close to Europa which the Hexans believe to be like Ganymede, entirely devoid of civilized life. Its original humanity was totally destroyed, and all its civilized Hexans are finding shelter from our torpedoes upon Jupiter until we of Callisto shall likewise have been annihilated. The temperature of Europa will suit you. Its atmosphere, while less dense than that to which you are accustomed, will adequately support your life. If we are not detected in the course of the next few hours we can probably land upon Europa in safety, since its neighborhood is guarded but loosely. In fact, we have a city there, as yet unsuspected by the Hexans, in which our scientists will continue to labor after Callisto's civilization shall have disappeared. We think that it will be safe to use your power for the short time necessary to effect a landing. We shall land in a cavern, in a crater already in communication with our city. In that cavern, instructed and aided by some of us, you will build a rocket vessel, no rays can be used because of the hexans, in which you will be able to travel to a region close enough to your earth so that you can call for help. You will not be able to carry enough fuel to land there, in fact, nearly all the journey will have to be made without power, traveling freely in a highly elongated orbit around the sun, but if you escape the hexans, you should be able to reach home safely, in time. It is for the consideration of this plan that this meeting has been called. Just one question, Breckenridge spoke. The Hexans are intelligent. Why are they leaving Europa and Ganymede so unguarded that human beings can move back there and that we can land there, all undetected? I will answer that question myself, replied King. Captain Zub did not quite do justice to his own people. It is true that they are being conquered, but for every human life that is taken, a thousand hexans die, and for every human ship that is lost, twenty hexan vessels are annihilated in return. While the hexans are masters of rays, the humans are equally masters of explosives and of mechanisms. They can hit a perfect score upon any target in free space whose course and acceleration can be determined, at any range up to 5,000 kilometers and they have explosives thousands of times as powerful as any known to us. Ray screens are effective only against rays, and the hexans cannot destroy anything they cannot see before it strikes them. 
So it is that all the Hexen vessels except those necessary to protect their own strongholds are being concentrated against Callisto. They cannot spare vessels to guard uselessly the abandoned satellites. Because of the enormously high gravity of Jupiter the Hexans there are safe from human attack safe for ineffectual long-range bombardment, but Io is being attacked constantly and it is probable that in a few more years Io also will be an abandoned world. Some of you may have received the impressions that the Hexans are to triumph immediately, but such an idea is wrong. The humans can, and will, hold out for a hundred years or more unless the enemy perfects a destructive ray of the type referred to. Even then, I think that our human cousins will hold out a long time. They are able men, fighters all, and their underground cities are beautifully protected. There was little argument. Most of the auditors could understand that the suggested course was the best one possible. The remainder were so stunned by the unbelievable events of the attack that they had no initiative, but were willing to follow wherever the more valiant spirits led. It was decided that no attempt should be made to salvage any portion of the Arcturus, since any such attempt would be fraught with danger and since the wreckage would be of little value. The new vessel was to be rocket-driven and was to be built of Calistonian alloys. Personal belongings were moved into lifeboats, doors were closed, and there ensued a painful period of waiting and suspense. The stated hour was reached without event, no Hexen scout had come close enough to them to detect the low-tension radiation of the vital machinery of the Arcturus, cut as it was to the irreducible minimum and quite effectively grounded as it was by the enormous mass of her shielding armor. At a signal from Captain Zub the pilot of each lifeboat shot his tiny craft out into space and took his allotted place in the formation following closely behind the Zark, flying toward Europa, now so large in the field of vision that she resembled more a world than a moon. Captain King, in the Calistonian vessel, transmitted to Breckenridge the route and flight data given him by the navigator of the winged craft. The chief pilot, Flying Point, in turn relayed more detailed instructions to the less experienced pilots of the other lifeboats. Soon the surface of Europa lay beneath them, a rugged, cratered, and torn topography of mighty ranges of volcanic mountains. Most of the craters were cold and lifeless, but here and there a plume of smoke and steam betrayed the presence of vast, quiescent forces. Straight down one of those gigantic lifeless shafts the fleet of spacecraft dropped, straight down a full two miles before the landing signal was given. At the bottom of the shaft a section of the rocky wall swung aside, revealing the yawning black mouth of a horizontal tunnel. At intervals upon its roof there winked into being almost invisible points of light. Along that line of lights the lifeboats felt their way, coming finally into a huge cavern, against one sheer metal wall of which they parked in an orderly row. Roll was called, and the terrestrials walked, as well as they could in the feeble gravity of the satellite, across the vast chamber and into a conveyance somewhat resembling a railway coach, which darted away as soon as the doors were shut. For hundreds of miles that strange tunnel extended, and as the car shot along door after door of natural rock opened before it, and closed as soon as it had sped through. In spite of the high velocity of the vehicle, it required almost two hours to complete the journey. Finally, however, it slowed to a halt and the terrestrial visitors disembarked at a portal of the European city of the Calistonians. Attention, barked Captain King. The name of this city, as nearly as I can come to it in English, is Rusk. Rusk comes fairly close to it and is easier to pronounce. We must finish our trip in small cars, holding ten persons each. We shall assemble again in the building in which we have been assigned quarters. The driver of each car will lead his passengers to the council room in which we shall meet. Oh, what's the use, this is horrible, horrible, we might as well die, a nervous woman shrieked, and fainted. Such a feeling is, perhaps, natural, King went on, after the woman had been revived and quiet had been restored, but please control it as much as possible. We are alive and well, and will be able to return to Telus eventually. Please remember that these people are putting themselves to much trouble and inconvenience to help us, desperate as their own situation is, and conduct yourselves accordingly. 
The rebuke had its effect, and with no further protest the company boarded the small cars, which shot through an opening in the wall and into a street of that strange subterranean city. Breckenridge, in the last car to leave the portal, studied his surroundings with interest as his conveyance darted through the gateway. More or less a fatalist by nature and an adventurer, of course, since no other type existed among the older spacehounds of the IPC, he was intensely interested in every new phase of their experience, and was no whit dismayed or frightened. He found himself seated in a narrow canoe of metal, immediately behind the pilot, who sat at a small control panel in the bow. Propelled by electromagnetic fields above a single rail, upon lightly touching and noiseless wheels, the terrestrial pilot saw with keen appreciation the manner in which switch after switch ahead of them obeyed the impulses sent ahead from the speeding car. The streets were narrow and filled with monorails, pedestrians pursued their courses upon walks attached to the walls of the buildings, far above the level of the streets. The walls were themselves peculiar, rising as they did stark, unbroken, windowless expanses of metal, merging into and supporting a massive roof of the same silvery metal. Walls and roof alike reflected a soft, yet intense, white light. Soon a sliding switch ahead of them shot in and simultaneously an opening appeared in the blank metal wall of a building. Through the opening the streetcar flew, and as the pilot slowed the canoe to a halt, the door slid smoothly shut behind them. Parking the car beside a row of its fellows, the Calistonian driver indicated that the terrestrials were to follow him and led the way into a large hall. There the others from the Arcturus were assembled, facing Captain King, who was standing upon a table. Fellow travelers, King addressed them, our course of action has been decided. There are 203 of us. There will be 20 sections of 10 persons, each section being in charge of one of the officers of the Arcturus. Dr. Penfield, our surgeon, a man whose intelligence, fairness, and integrity are unquestioned, will be in supreme command. His power and authority will be absolute, limited only by the Calistonian Council. He will work in harmony with the engineer, who is to direct the entire project of building the new vessel. Each of you will be expected to do whatever he can, the work you will be asked to do will be well within your powers, and you will each have ample leisure for recreation, study, and amusement, of all of which you will find unsuspected stores in this underground community. You will each be registered and studied by physicians, surgeons, and psychologists, and each of you will have prescribed for him the exact diet that is necessary for his best development. You will find this diet somewhat monotonous, compared to our normal fare of natural products, since it is wholly synthetic, but that is one of the minor drawbacks that must be endured. Chief Pilot Breckenridge and I will not be with you. In some small and partial recompense for what they are doing for us all, he and I are going with Captain Zuff to Callisto, there to see whether or not we can aid them in any way in the fight against the Hexans. One last word, Dr. Penfield's rulings will be the products of his own well-ordered mind after consultation and agreement with the council of this city, and will be for the best good of all. I do not anticipate any refusal to cooperate with him. If, however, such refusal should occur, please remember that he is a despot with absolute power, and that anyone obstructing the program by refusing to follow his suggestions will spend the rest of his time here in confinement and will go back to Tellus in Irons, if at all. In case Chief Pilot Breckenridge and I should not see you again, we bid you goodbye and wish you a safe voyage, but we expect to go back with you. Brief farewells were said and Captain and Pilot accompanied Zuff to one of the little streetcars. Out of the building it dashed and down the crowded but noiseless thoroughfare to the portal. Signal lights flashed briefly there and they did not stop, but tore on through the portal and the tunnel, with increasing speed. Don't have to transfer to a big car, then, asked Breckenridge. No, King made answer. Small cars can travel these tubes as well as the large ones, and on much less power. In the city the wheels touch the rails lightly, not for support, but to make contacts through which traffic signals are sent and received. In the tunnels the wheels do not touch at all, as signaling is unnecessary, the tunnels being used infrequently and by but one vehicle at a time. No trolleys, tracks, or wires are visible, you notice. Everything is hidden from any possible visere of the Hexans. 
how about their power? I don't understand it very well, hardly at all, in fact. It is quite simple. To the surprise of both terrestrials, Zub was speaking English, but with a strong and very peculiar accent, sliding all the vowels and accenting heavily the consonant sounds. The car no longer requires my attention, so I am now free to converse. You are surprised at my knowing your language? You will speak mine after a few more applications of the thought exchanger. I am speaking with a vile accent, of course, but that is merely because my vocal organs are not accustomed to making vowel sounds. Our power is obtained by the combustion of gases in highly efficient turbines. It is transmitted and used as direct current, our generator and motors being so constructed that they can produce no etheric disturbances capable of penetrating the shielding walls of our city. The city was built close to deposits of coal, oil, and gas of sufficient amount to support our life for thousands of years, for from these deposits come power, food, clothing, and all the other necessities and luxuries of our lives. Strong fans draw air from various extinct craters, force it through ventilating ducts into every room and recess of the city, and exhaust it into the shaft of a quiescent volcano, in whose gaseous outflow any trace of our activities is, of course, imperceptible. For obvious reasons no rockets or combustion motors are used in the city proper. Thus Captain Zub explained to the terrestrials his own mode of life, and received from them in turn full information concerning earthly life, activity, and science. Long they talked, and it was almost time to slow down for the journey's end when the Calistonian brought the conversation back to their immediate concerns. My lieutenant and I were upon a mission of some importance, but it is more important to take you to Callisto, for there may be many things in which you can help us. Not in rays, we know all the vibrations you have mentioned in several others. The enemy, however, is supreme in that field and until our scientists have succeeded in developing ray screens, such as are used by the Hexans, it would be suicidal to use rays at all. Such screens necessitate the projection of pure, yet dirigible, forces, you do not have them upon your planet? No, and so far as I know such screens are also unknown upon Mars and Venus, with whose inhabitants we are friendly. The inhabitants of all the planets should be friendly. The solar system should be linked together in intercourse for common advancement. But that is not to be. The Hexans will eventually triumph here, and a Jovian system peopled by Hexans will have no intercourse with any human civilization save that of internecine war. We, of Callisto, have only one hope, or is it really a hope? In the south polar country of Jupiter, there dwells a race of beings implacably hostile to the Hexans. They seem to invade the country of the Hexans frequently, even though they are apparently repulsed each time. Our emissaries to the South Polar Country, however, have never returned, those beings, whatever they are, if not actively inimical, certainly are not friendly toward us. You know nothing of their nature? Nothing, since our electrical instruments are not sufficiently sensitive to give us more than a general idea of what is transpiring there and vision is practically useless in that eternal fog. We know, however, that they are far advanced in science, and we are thankful indeed that none of their frightful flying fortresses have been launched against us. They apparently are not interested in the satellites, and it is no doubt due to their unintentional assistance that we have survived as long as we have. In the cavern at last, the three men boarded the Calistonian spaceplane and were shot up the crater's shaft. The voyage to Callisto was uneventful, even uninteresting save at its termination. The Zark, coated every inch as it was with a dull, dead black, completely absorptive outer coating, entered the thin layer of Callisto's atmosphere in darkest night, with all rockets dead, with not a light showing, and with no apparatus of any kind functioning. Utterly invisible and undetectable, she dove downward, and not until she was well below the crater's rim did the forward rockets burst into furious life. Then the terrestrials understood another reason for the immense depth of those shafts other than that of protection from the detectors of the enemy, all the distance was necessary to overcome the velocity of their free fall without employing a negative acceleration greater than the frail Calistonian bodies could endure. From the cavern at the foot of the shaft, 
a regulation tunnel extended to the Calistonian city of Zbark. Portal and city were very like Rusk, upon distant Europa, and soon the terrestrial captain and pilot were in conference with the Council of Callisto. Months of earthly time dragged slowly past, months during which King and Breckenridge studied intensively the offensive and defensive systems of Callisto without finding any particular in which they could improve them to any considerable degree. Captain Zub and his warplane still survived, and it was while the Calistonian commander was visiting his terrestrial guests, that king voiced the discontent that had long affected both men. We're both tired of doing nothing, Zuv. We have been of little real benefit, and we have decided that your ideas of us are all wrong. We are convinced that our personal horsepower can be of vastly more use to you than our brain power, which doesn't amount to much. Your whole present policy is one of hiding and sniping. I think that I know why, but I want to be sure. Your vessels carry lots of fuel, why can the Hexans outrun you? Thus did King put his problem. They can stand enormously higher accelerations than we can. The very strongest of us loses consciousness at an acceleration of 25 meters per second per second, no matter how he is braced, and that is only a little greater than the normal gravity of our enemies upon Jupiter. Their vessels at highest power develop an acceleration of 35 meters, and the hexans themselves can stand much more than even that high figure, replied Zov. I thought so. Assume that you traveled at 45. Would it disable you permanently, or would you recover as soon as it was lowered? We would recover promptly, unless the exposure had been unduly prolonged. Why? Because, said King, I can stand an acceleration of 54 meters for two hours, and Breckenridge here tests 52 meters. I can navigate anything, and Breckenridge can observe as well as any of your own men. Build a plane to accelerate at 45 meters and we will blow those hexans out of the ether. You will have to revive and do the shooting, however, your gunnery is entirely beyond us. That is an idea of promise and one that had not occurred to any of us, Zov replied and work was begun at once upon the new flyer. When the superplane was ready for its maiden voyage, its crew of three studied it as it lay in the catapult at the portal. Dead black as were all the warplanes, its body was twice as large as that of the ordinary vessel, its wings were even more stubby, and its accommodations had been cut to a minimum to make room for the enormous stores of fuel necessary to drive the greatly increased battery of rocket motors and for the extra supply of torpedoes carried. Waving to the group of soldiers and citizens gathered to witness the takeoff of the new dreadnought of space, the three men entered the cramped operating compartment, strapped themselves into their seats, and were shot away. As usual the driving rockets were cut off well below the rim of the shaft, and the vessel rose in a long and graceful curve, invisible in the night. Such was its initial velocity and so slight was the force of gravity of the satellite that they were many hundreds of miles from the exit before they began to descend, and Breckenridge studied his screens narrowly for signs of hex activity. Do you want to try one of your long-range shots when we find one of them? The pilot asked Zov. No, it would be useless. Between deflection by air currents and the dodging of the enemy vessels, our effective range is shortened to a few kilometers, and their beams are deadly at that distance. No, our best course is to follow the original plan, to lure them out into space at uniform acceleration, where we can destroy them easily. Right, and Breckenridge turned to King, who was frowning at his controls. How does she work on a dead stick, Chief? Maneuverability about minus 10 at this speed and in this air. She'd have to have at least 1500 kilometers an hour to be responsive out here. See anything yet? Not yet, wait a minute. Yes, there's one now, P12 on Area 5. Give us all the X10 and W27 you can, without using power, we want to edge over close enough so that she can't help but see us when we start the rockets. Be sure and stay well out of range. I'm giving her all she'll take, but she won't take much. 
With these wings she has the gliding angle of a kitchen sink. All X, I'm watching the range, close. Wish we had instruments like these on the IPVs. We'll have to install some when we get back. All X. Give her the gun, level and dead ahead. Half the battery of rockets burst into their stuttering, explosive roar of power and the vessel darted away in headlong flight. He sees us and is after us, turn her straight up. A searing, coruscating finger of flame leaped toward them, but their calculations had been sound, the hexen was harmless at that extreme range. King, under the pilot's direction, kept the plane at a safe distance from the sphere while the satellite grew smaller and smaller behind them and Zub lapsed quietly into unconsciousness. He's been out for quite a while. Far enough, asked King. All X now, I guess, don't believe they can see the flash from here. Cut. The rockets died abruptly and a blast from the side ports threw the plane out of the beam and once out of it, beyond range of the electromagnetic detectors as they were their coating of absolute black rendered the craft safe from observation. One dirigible rocket remained in action, its exhaust hidden from the enemy by the body of the vessel, and Captain Zov soon recovered his senses. Wonderful, gentlemen, he exclaimed, as he manipulated the delicate controls of his gunnery panel. This is the first time in history that a Calistonian vessel has escaped from a hexen by speed alone. An instantaneously extinguished flare of incandescence marked the passing of the hexen sphere into nothingness, and the cruiser shot back toward Callisto in search of more prey. It was all too plentiful, and twenty times the drama was reenacted before approaching day made it necessary for Zuff to take the controls and dive the vessel into the westernmost landing shaft of Zbark. A rousing and enthusiastic welcome awaited them, and joy spread rapidly when their success became known. Now we know what to do, and we had better do it immediately, before they get our system figured out and increase their own power. King reported to the council. You might send a couple of ships to Europa and bring back as many of the Tellurian officers as want to come and can be spared from the work there. They all test above 45 meters, and they can learn this stuff in short order. While they're coming, your engineers can be building more ships like this one. The new vessel did not make another voyage until nine sister ships were ready and manned, each with two terrestrial officers and one Calistonian gunner. All ten took to the ether at once, and the Hexen fleet melted away like frost crystals before a summer sun. A few weeks of carnage and destruction and not a Hexen was within range of the detectors of Callisto, they were gone. This is the first time in years that Callisto's air has been free of the Hexens, Zav said, thoughtfully. With your help we have reduced their strength to a fraction of what it was, but they have not given up. They will return, with a higher acceleration than even you terrestrials, powerful as you are, can stand. Certainly they will, but you will be no worse off than you were before you can return to your own highly effective tactics. We are infinitely better off for your help. You have given us a new lease on life. He broke off as a flaring light sprang into being upon the portal board and the observer of Exit 1 made his report, there was a hexen vessel in the air, location 425 over VJ-42. There's one left. Let us get him. No, he's ours. Confused shouts arose from the bullpen, but the original superplane was at the top of the callboard and accordingly King, Breckenridge, and Zub embarked upon an expedition more hazardous far than they had supposed an expedition whose every feature was relayed to those in the portal by the automatic lookouts upon the rims and which was ended before a single supporting Calistonian plane could be launched. For the enemy vessel was not the last of the low-powered Hexen vessels, as everyone had supposed it was the first of the high-powered craft, arriving long before its appearance was expected. Before its terrific acceleration and savage onslaught, the superplane might as well have been stationary and unarmed. After his long dive downward, 
King could not even leave the atmosphere, the Hexen was upon them within a few seconds, even though the stupendous battery of rockets, full driven, had roared almost instantly into desperate action. Bomb after bomb Breckenridge hurled, with full radio control, fighting with every resource at his command, but in vain. The frightful torpedoes were annihilated in mid-flight, and nose, tail assembly, and wings were sheared neatly from the warplane by a sizzling plane of force. Side rockets and torpedo tubes were likewise sliced away and the helpless body of the Calistonian cruiser, falling like a plummet, was caught and held by a tractor ray. Captor and captive settled toward the ground. This is a signal honor, observed Captain Zuv when he had revived. It has been many, many cycles since they have taken Calistonians captive. They kill us at every opportunity. Is it your custom to destroy yourselves in a situation such as this? It is not. While we live there is hope. Not ours. Unless they have made enormous strides in psychological mechanisms, they cannot tear from our minds any secrets we really wish to keep. That is useless, he went on, as King lifted a hand weapon. You will have no opportunity whatever to use it, and he was right. A searing beam of energy drove them out of the vessel, then electromagnetic waves burned every metallic object out of their possession. Burning rays herded them into the hexen sphere and into a small room, whose door clanged shut behind them. Ah, two are humans of a strange breed, a snarling voice barked from the wall, in the Calistonian language. Our deductions were accurate, as usual, it is to the humans of Planet 3, whose bodies are a trifle less puny than those of the humanity of the satellites, that we owe our recent reverses. However, those reverses were merely temporary humanity, no matter what its breed, shall very shortly disappear from the satellites. Now, you scum of the solar system, you shall be permitted to witness an entrancing spectacle on the way to our headquarters, where all your knowledge is to be taken from you before you die, lingeringly and horribly. There is a strange space vessel nearing us probably searching for the one we took and which you dogs of Callisto must have been fortunate enough to take from us before we could study and kill its human cargo. Watch its destruction and cringe and know, in your suffering, that the more you suffer, the greater shall be our enjoyment. I believe that, King acknowledged. As all three prisoners stared at the wall screen, upon which was pictured a huge football of scarred gray steel, Zuv was amazed to see the faces of Breckenridge and King light up with fierce smiles of pleasure and anticipation. You dissemble well, remarked the Calistonian. That will rob them of much pleasure. They'll get robbed of more than that, King returned. This is too good to keep, and since they cannot understand English, I'll tell you something. I told you about Stevens. He apparently wasn't killed, as we thought. He must have escaped, and there is the result. That ship there is far from innocent, her being so far out of range of any of our power plants proves that. That vessel is the Sirius, the research laboratory of the IPC, the Interplanetary Corporation. It carries the greatest scientific minds of three of the inner planets, and it is loaded with pure poison or it wouldn't be here. Oh, you hexans, what you have got coming to you? Concluding a thrilling new serial of interplanetary life and travel by Edward E. Smith, Ph.D. Author of A Skylark of Space and Skylark 3